Jesus changed everything. Jesus changed everything. And for those of you who haven't picked up on it, there's something about a dead guy on a Friday who was alive on a Sunday that kind of makes people sit back and go, what happened? So we're going we're gonna to try and unpack that because it is finished from Friday night, turns into a Sunday morning, he is risen. And that changes everything. The world is never going to be the same again. And so we're going to look at that. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Mike Oldham. I'm the lead pastor here uh, at Church of the Rock. And I want to welcome everybody here. I thank you for taking your time to come out here this Easter morning. John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that there may be clearly seen that his and her works have been carried out in God. That is one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. Even people who don't open up their Bibles or even own a Bible If you've watched one football game in your life, you've seen the sign that says John 3.16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And so I want to acknowledge this morning as we work into this story, which I haven't read yet, which is, we'll get to it, I guess. We're off to the races. I do want to acknowledge this morning that while many of you here today are long-term believers, and you've actually been very comfortable within this story, It makes a lot of sense to you. It makes a lot of sense to me because I've spent the majority of my adult life understanding this and studying this. But I do want to acknowledge this morning that there are many of you probably who are sitting here today either as guests or just long-term people who have been coming to The Rock who perhaps are a little bit skeptical. You kind of wonder how this can all work itself out, how this makes sense. Perhaps you're even a critic of the story and you're not even entirely certain that any of it's true and that those of us who do believe it are just a half a bubble off center when we put the level on the table. But you see, in our world where the default mode is, to, is distrust and cynicism, I'd like to invite you this morning as we walk through this passage of Scripture to not only open your minds this Easter morning, but as important, probably even more importantly, is to allow your hearts to be opened as well. To hear, perhaps completely afresh, or maybe for the first time, what happened on that Easter morning all those years ago. Because looking at this story that we're gonna unpack and to celebrate this morning, I admit, it's a story that's hard to believe if you're on the outside looking in. Sometimes even on the inside looking in, it's a little bit difficult to believe. To think for a minute that anyone could believe the story of the Bible and this resurrection story more specifically, and then be able to think that you don't have to check your brains at the door is always the argument that I get. You can't believe something like this unless you're disengaged from actual good thinking. And I want to walk through the fact today that that is not true. The Bible is a book that can be believed, that should be believed, that it can be believed both rationally as well as emotionally. That you don't have to check your brains at the door, nor do you have to lead just on emotion as if you have to believe something that's unreal. We don't need to give up common sense in order to, in exchange for what some would call a fantasy story. That is not what the Bible is about. For if this story is true, if what we are looking at today, and I present to you that it is true, if it is true, then Jesus has changed absolutely everything in this world. If it's not true, don't listen. But don't make that decision until I'm done. We've scattered. We've scattered in so many directions. Everything just fell apart. We were sitting in the garden that night and just all of a sudden they came out of the dark and everything just fell apart. We're struggling now, hiding trying to figure out exactly what happened, trying to figure out what was going on. Because when he came down that hill at the beginning of the week on that donkey, it started so well. 
We were all excited, everything looked great. Jesus was in total control. He let him have it at the temple. He established exactly who he was. He taught through a whole bunch of stuff throughout the whole week. He prayed for people. He spent more time with us than he'd had in the three years that we had walked with him, teaching us all about what was gonna happen after, teaching us all about what was gonna happen in the now, how it is we're supposed to figure out what's going on in real time in front of us, what was about to happen. None of us understood. Not a one of us. We all just sat there. None of it made sense. All of his talk about being handed over to the authorities at the end of the week after the way the week started, all of his talk about being punished for us made no sense. And then being crucified, not only for us, but everybody else. We sat there trying to make sense of this. He'd said it before. He even went so far as to tell us that he would rise again on the third day. We're sitting around the fire trying to make sense of a comment like that when we're still asking him questions about the whole Lazarus come out deal. It wasn't too long before then that Mary and Martha's brother died and he'd been in the grave and he'd been in the ground for four days. And finally Jesus decides to go there and he just simply says, Lazarus, come out. And out of the grave comes this guy who'd been dead for four days, wrapped up in clothes. And we couldn't even get our hands around that. And now he's telling us that he's going to rise again after three days. He's got to mean something else. This is not logical, and it makes no sense at all. Every one of us sitting around that fire that night, having that Passover meal, we understood that when human beings die, they stay dead wasn't making sense he's got to mean something else and why would God if he so loved the world would he do something so cruel to the one who is claiming to be his son you see any skeptic any critic anybody who is outside of the faith even sometimes those who are within the faith will ask these questions and more we live in a time where fear, where doubt, and where cynicism rules. Our culture and our world, it seems very clear to me, has its feet firmly planted in midair, believing anything and everything. And we will believe a lot of things in this world, regardless of how grounded they can be in science and in reality and in the world around us. We will believe anything in this world, but we will not believe this. This story is just a bit too weird, and it's a bit too out there. Belief has now become what I call an ethereal thing. And what does that mean? Well, it's all about how I feel. It's all about how I feel today. It's all about my personal story and how deeply that defines me as a human being and how I'm going to hold on to that. We can all relate to that. Every one of us has a story to tell. It defines who we are in good ways and in bad. But we have to be careful because it can define us in a way that has never defined us before, most especially when those things are deeply rooted in our personal subjective feelings, both good and bad. And that is something that we have to remember as we gather around this story this morning to understand. Because you see, here is the reality of what we're looking at in the Bible today. This is their story. This is their story. The disciples. The people who were alive when they saw this man Jesus. This is their narrative. With all of the feels. All of the fear. All of the doubt. All of the concern, all of the crying, all of the confusion, this is their story. They were men and women just like you and me. They thought just like you and me. They wondered what we were having for dinner on Tuesday. They wondered if their kids were going to grow up okay. They wondered what the world was going to look like, how Rome was going to treat them. They were no different than we were. But this Easter story is their story. And because it is their story, it becomes our story. 
And if it is our story, it is only our story because ultimately it is God's story on how it is he's going to fix this world and what it is he was doing. But we have to acknowledge in a world full of many gods and their many stories, this one's a little out there. It isn't like anything that's ever been written before in this world. I know you can find little bits and pieces here and there. We can have that conversation anytime anybody wants. And all the myth stories of old, there's little things that you can pull in in some of the ancient writings with bits and pieces that are similar to this, but none was like this. None at all was like this of what happened that Easter morning. For believer and skeptic alike this morning, there has never been anyone like Jesus of Nazareth in the history of humanity. Even the non-believer will acknowledge this, that he said some things that nobody else ever said. He circled every single thing around himself in his ministry. He circled truth around himself. He circled salvation for humanity around himself. He talked about our origins, where we come from. He gave us meaning, why it is we're here. Everything was circled around him. He even talked about not just our existence here, but where we're going. So where we come from, to what we're to be doing here now, to where it is we're to go, everything was circled in and around Jesus. All of those answers, he said, could be found in him. He taught people and he ministered people as he walked through this world. And yet even his closest followers, even his closest followers doubted. They doubted when he was taken from them. Think for a minute about how you would have felt if you had spent three years of your life following this man. In fact, when he was ripped away from them in the garden on that night, every one of them fled in 12 different directions or 11 or however many people were there. They took off into the night, left them there all by himself. Even the lead follower, the one who always wrote checks that his backside could never cash, could not even get through the night without denying the fact that he even knew who Jesus was. Peter, the rock, I will go to the cross with you. A little 12-year-old servant girl comes up and says, Mister, you sound like him. You're one of his followers. I, I don't know who he is. I don't know who he is. These are the people who knew him the best. They all abandoned him. If you ever want to tell a story to future generations about the success of a Messiah, you certainly don't start by showing all the failures of the men who would eventually be sent out into all the world to tell people about who this Jesus is. That ain't how you write a good story. Unless, of course, that's exactly what happened. Then it makes all the sense in the world. If that's the actual truth of what unpacked itself on on that night, that's what you tell them. You see, this past Friday, we left off with the Roman centurion standing at the foot of the cross, making this comment that as he watched Jesus breathe his last and die, he said, surely he is, he is the son of God. This is a Roman centurion. Another observation from a horrible day that I cannot miss and that we should never miss is the note of women, the note of women in this story who even at a distance, with the exception of John the Apostle, were the only ones, the only ones who stayed with Jesus to the end. Mark 15 and verse 40. There were also women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him and there were also many other women who came up to him in Jerusalem the women watched the man named Joseph of Arimathea at risk to himself. He was a Pharisee. They had watched what he was doing. He went and he asked for the body of Jesus, putting himself at risk. He too wanted to make sure that Jesus was anointed for burial. That's not what you did with crucified people. Part of the indignity of being crucified is you let them stay up on that cross until there's nothing left to them. Not that there was much to begin with. But Joseph risks his own reputation and says, I want to bury him and give him dignity. And the lady saw that. One doesn't do that for a sick man. He didn't faint. He wasn't unconscious. He wasn't half dead. No. 
What you do for people who are dead is you bring them to a tomb and you anoint them for burial. That's what was going on there. He didn't wake up later in severe pain and then get healed and walk out. He was dead. And we have to acknowledge that it was the women. It was the women again, that very first beautiful Easter morning who could not wait until the moment when they could find what they needed to get out of that house and to go finish what they had started or what Joseph had started at that grave. They wanted to get there as soon as it was allowed to the tomb so that they could honor Jesus. They knew where to go. Another challenge to the story is, oh, you got these emotional women. They just couldn't remember what tomb it was. and That's an insult. One that we should probably park. Actually, we ought to park. Just because they were women doesn't mean their testimony isn't valid. But that's the argument. Oh, well, they must have been just so distraught that they went to the wrong grave the next day. They were like one street over. I can be gone from Foxborough, Massachusetts for a decade, and you can put me at any entrance to Rock Hill Cemetery in Foxborough, Massachusetts, and pretty much blindfold me, and I can walk you to where my great-grandmother and my grandfather are buried. You don't forget where a loved one is put. That never happens. So to insult the intelligence of these women by saying perhaps they were emotional and confused and therefore the story isn't real is us reading something in there that should never be there. One day was all these ladies had waited and they were hurt and they were scared and they were crying because they had lost their master. They knew where to go. There was no way they were gonna go to the wrong tomb. And they went to that tomb with just two things in mind. Number one, we want to finish the job that started before Sabbath came about. We wanted to anoint the body of Jesus. And second, in order to do what someone, they'll have to roll that stone away. I could, you know, two ladies going in there, you got a big gravestone. And that's not an insult either. Two ladies could not move that stone. It usually took more than one or two men to move a big stone like that. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, Mark 16, verses 1 through 4, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the very large stone had been rolled back. It was very large. That is a detail we don't want to miss. The beauty of this story is that people like Mark capture those details. This wasn't a pebble they were kicking out of the way. This was a heavy stone door. Why do we think like this? Why are they thinking that they're just going to go and anoint a body? Why are they thinking that they need to roll the stone away? Because along with them and the other disciples, as every other normal human being would think, is that they were thinking it's over. It's over. There's nothing left for us here. The ladies and the disciple John had watched Jesus die. They saw what really happened. The ladies had seen him buried in a tomb. It was over. Because that's what happens when people are crucified. After all, once again, death is final. Anyone who knows anything knows that. And their hearts were broken. Their hearts were broken. What about Peter? Imagine Peter. Real braggy guy saying all the things that he said. I, 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 you lost in thought. Can you imagine? Sitting in a room somewhere. Struggling with the fact that the last thing that he did when he saw Jesus... Luke records for us that Jesus looked right in his eyes when he said this. He denied him for the third time. And the last thing that he remembers is Jesus looking at him as he's doing the very thing he said he would never do. Just as an aside for all of us here as I slowly glide into geezerhood, take care how you say goodbye. Leave this thought with you. We never know when the last time we're going to say goodbye to somebody is. 
We have no idea the last time we're going to back out of a driveway. Close the door. Kiss your wife on the forehead. Take care how you say your goodbyes. Because we just don't ever know. We just don't ever know. Moving on. I leave that with you. But here they go. They're there. The stone's already been moved. Problem number two is solved. Still no thought at all about anything other than we got to get into the grave and we got to finish this task ahead. We want to tend to the body of Jesus. He deserves that respect. And here's an interesting thing. The way for the tomb had already been open for them. But it wasn't so Jesus could get out because Jesus could walk through doors in his resurrected body. Again, another bizarre detail, but that's where it's at. The door was open so that they could get in, not so Jesus could get out. And so that they could get in with purpose, so that they could see that there wasn't a body in that tomb. There's no guessing here. The tomb is empty. They entered the tomb. They saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe. That's an angel. And they were alarmed, as any of us would be. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See this place where they laid him. In other words, here's where he was. Here's the grave clothes. Ain't nobody there. There's the evidence. Look with your eyes at what you're seeing. They were alarmed. Wouldn't you be? This is not normal. And let's again just pause for a moment this Easter morning and recognize that fact. For those of you who walk in Christ when you're out in the world, be patient with those who do not. Because we have to acknowledge that this story stretches people. Where faith comes in. People could have written any sort of happy ending they wanted for this horrific story. And one far easier to believe. Writers do it all the time. The hero is all of a sudden, he's out of the way. We all know it. Any of you who watch these types of shows, all of a sudden, he's tossed out the window. There's panic. Everybody thinks everything's going to collapse. All of this stuff. And then cue the dramatic music. And then the hero shows back up and saves the whole day. It's that Darth Vader moment for those of you who are as old as I am when it first came out, The Return of the Jedi. We're all waiting to see what Darth Vader is going to do. And then he grabs the emperor, picks him up over his shoulders, and hucks him down that tube. And the whole place erupts. That's what's going on here. You could have written a story like that. But that's all just fantasy. It's cool fantasy. But it's all just fantasy. Why then is this story so different than that? And that's a great question to ask. What makes this unbelievable story that we're looking at today so believable? What benefit it would it be to paint such a gruesome picture on a Friday full of death where the one who promised victory is brutally killed and loses the battle? What benefit it would be for anybody? That's a question that needs to be asked if we're going to be honest. What benefit it would it be to write about all of the failures of his followers if those things were not true? If we're not trying to show the grace of God, the hope of God, the love of God, and the truth of what God is doing. Why tell a story of an empty tomb of a risen Savior whom Rome killed and will kill you too the minute you keep running your mouth about this foolishness with a blink of an eye because they were in power? Why do that if it weren't true? You see, Jesus... While he was alive, made it very clear that all of these things were going to happen. This is another beautiful thing here. That God had planned this out before time began. That he was going to fix the world through Jesus. In Matthew chapter 20 verse 17, he says, And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside. On the way he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. And they'll condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day would you like some potatoes with your lamb the Bible says this is the third time he painted this very clear picture was it a metaphor was it symbolic was it a narcissistic delusion of a crazy carpenter from the north or or was it Jesus being very real and very clear about his task in time 
Because you see, one thing that we also need to look at is that Jesus did everything very publicly. Nothing was done in secret. We touched on this a little bit on Friday night, but all of the miracles that Jesus did, he didn't do in a closet somewhere. All of the healings that happened, Jesus didn't do in a closet somewhere. All of his teachings were done in and around the temple and in and around synagogue for everybody to hear and for everybody to see. You read the Gospels and you will find that that is what is going on. And those who wanted to kill him never denied anything he did. Never once is it recorded in the Bible that they said that what he did was a lie. They were just mad at him because he was doing it on the wrong day of the week and he was doing it for the people that they didn't like. That was the issue. But never once did the people who hated him deny the fact that what he was doing was true. Jesus said all of these things very publicly. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers, former atheist wrestling with who Jesus was and all of his studies. He's author of the Chronicles of Narnia, for those of you who don't know who C.S. Lewis is. Upon examining Jesus and the claims that he made, said that Jesus was one of three things. He was a lunatic, he was a liar, or he was actually who he claimed to be. He was Lord. Now, being a lunatic and a liar, we have to ask the question, what benefit would it have been for him to be a lunatic or a liar? I suppose if you're crazy, you don't know you're crazy, but again, that's for another time, I suppose. But let's be honest. What benefit is there for him? None. In order for the way to be made home for us, Jesus had to pass through death first. And C.S. Lewis finally discovered, he said, I was dragged into the kingdom kicking and screaming, the most reluctant convert in all of England, because I discovered that this Jesus was exactly who he said he was, Lord of all. I could not disprove the things he said. Jesus said, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'm going to rise. He declared it publicly, and he said something which anyone could disprove. Anybody could disprove which means it's historically verifiable. There's enough evidence to not sit at your table and go, I'm a little bit off center because I believe this. This is historically verifiable. He didn't promise a secret rising where only the inner sanctum would see him. He didn't talk about a great spiritual awakening that people would then go into the world and talk about all that nonsense. No. He said physically, walking out of that grave I'm going to be put in that hole in the ground and I'm walking out it's not going to be a mystery I'm going to be standing right there in front of you I will rise again that's very important for us and Paul in his earliest record of telling this this is what he says I delivered to you as of first importance and this won't be on your screen what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. In other words, if you want to verify what I'm telling you, go find these people. Though some have fallen asleep, in other words, some have died, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. You see, these are multiple witnesses who saw Jesus alive as Paul's writing, and he's actually saying, go talk to them. Don't take my word for it. So the argument then that the disciples snuck back in and took the body and hid the body to perpetuate this lie so they could somehow maintain power is ludicrous. What power did they have? What delusional fantasy were they trying to sell? They were so afraid that the Pharisees were going to come after them next that they'd lock themselves in a room. Remember, only the women had the courage to be outside, out and about. The men were cowarding in a room trying to figure out what to do next. Why would they go steal the body and ooh, push? They, they wouldn't. It makes no sense. To what benefit? I mean, move the body and try to convince people that he rose? How you'd last about five minutes under Rome at that point. People had already moved on the minute he was taken down from the cross. Why? Because they knew he was dead. Just another delusional guy from the north. We're moving on and looking for the next one. Why would the disciples in the future die horrible, violent deaths for a lie and for a liar? They wouldn't. 
Some of you are old enough to remember Chuck Colson. Those of you who aren't, Google him. Watergate. And I've read this before, but I just love this. He did prison for his illegal activity in Watergate. Came to Christ in prison, spent the rest of his life doing prison ministries. He writes this about the resurrection. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. Okay. Hold on. Here's how. Twelve men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. Then he says, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. (laughs) You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible absolutely impossible that's chuck colson see much like every other power rome was efficient at killing and intimidating people into submission there'd be no benefit for the disciples to lie there'd be none he's not here he's risen look he's where he said he's he, he here's where he was he's not here anymore and he told me to tell you ladies to go back and tell them he's not here now here to me as we look to park this this is really the most important thing we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because it gives us hope but I want you to see something in this story of Mark and this is one of the reasons why I went here this year instead of the other tellings there is such grace here and there is such mercy and there is such love in this next statement here that is written that he says go and tell his disciples and Peter that I am going ahead of you into Galilee There you will see him, just as he told you. Now let that sink in for a minute. Go and tell the disciples, and whatever you do, don't forget to tell Peter. Don't forget to tell Peter that when I ask for the disciples, that includes him. But Peter blew it. And not just a little, he blew it big time. Peter's a liar. Peter's a coward. Peter denied Jesus. That's that unpardonable sin for some denominations we have in this world. Full of legalism. Full of lacking grace. Where if somebody misses the mark, we're going to crucify you too because you wouldn't wear that t-shirt to school. Because you wouldn't stand down on the street corner handing out tracts and beating people over the head with the biggest Bible you have. No. I'm trying. (laughs) We're almost done. (laughs) It's one of my biggest critics. Grace. Grace. We are all sinners sitting here today. But we are all saved by grace through faith. We are all, every one of us, debtors to mercy alone. That is all we are. That is all we have. And I would submit to you that is all we need. We just need to recognize that. Therefore, you make sure my friend Peter is with you when you come up to see me in Galilee. Jesus changed everything changed everything Peter would realize this after a breakfast on a beach on the shores of Lake Galilee most important moment in Peter's life and he would never forget that for the rest of his days that I literally told a little girl I didn't know who Jesus was and he still said to me now you go into all the world and you tell people about me because I've picked you up I've cleaned you up I'm sending you out by grace through faith You're a debtor to mercy alone. Peter recognized that. I wonder this morning how many of us do. Do you recognize that? The grace that God has poured out upon you? Listen, if this story isn't true, like I said at the beginning, let's just go home. Let's have our ham. Let's watch whatever's on TV and enjoy the rest of the day. The world's still broken, trying to figure out how to answer all the questions of the crazy. 
and we've got nothing at all to help try and figure this out. However, I say to you, if this story is true, and I submit to you this morning that this is the only clear, true story, all of the evidence points to the fact that it is true. Then again, Jesus changed everything. Do you this morning understand the wonderfulness of God's grace towards you? His mercy upon you? Do not believe the lie that says to you every day that you have done so much wrong, that you have drifted so far away, that you have denied Jesus so many times that he's actually gonna turn his back on you. Don't believe that lie. That you've somehow run so far away that he's even stopped holding his hands out to you. Don't believe that lie. You see, God's grace is seen in this empty tomb. That's what's going on here. It's seen in the nail-scarred hands. It's seen in the words of the angel, tell the disciples and Peter. Think on this as you leave here today. Tell the disciples and Michael. Tell the disciples and Lisa. Tell the disciples and now you put your name there. Nobody sitting here today is so far gone that they're too far gone for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I submit this Jesus to you, most especially if you do not believe, for you to consider that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Today, if you hear his word, you have heard his voice through the speaking of his word, and that voice is calling you home. Do not harden your hearts, for Jesus has risen, he loves you, and he wants you.